Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us today for our first ever webinar about getting started on Jasmine, our data intensive supercomputer customised for environmental science. Firstly, to introduce who we are, I'm Poppy Townsend and my role has recently been developed to increase our communication with users and stakeholders. Ax Stevens is Head of Partnerships and is based in Exeter at the Met Office. Fatima Chami is a software engineer on the Jasmine team. And finally, Sam Pepler is involved with managing the Cedar Archive as Head of Curation. Uh, we will be recording this webinar and we will make it available on our website so you can rewatch it in the future. So, um, the webinar should take approximately one hour and we're going to have time at the end for questions. Uh, we will answer all questions via speaking over here and we will make them available afterwards as well. Um, so please send them to me on poppy.townsend at stfc.ac.uk but if you're watching a the recording then please send to our help desk. We would really love to hear what you think about the webinar. If you registered via Eventbrite you will receive an email with a link to a survey. This should only take you approximately five minutes. This will help us to improve our future webinars and help us tailor them to your needs. Here is a short list of topics that we will cover today. These are meant as an overview and are by no means an exhaustive list, but it gives an indication of what you can do with Jasmine. Now to hand over to Ag, who is going to talk about what Jasmine can be used for. Hello, so I'm Ag Stevens, and we imagine that you're um, probably quite new to Jasmine, so we'll give you a, an overview of what it might be used for, and one first view on that is to think about what Jasmine is in terms of hardware. So we have over 20 petabytes of high performance storage, and that's growing, as I'll mention later. Um, around 6,000 compute cores. Um, this is all underpinned with some high performance networking. Um, we have a private cloud um, for more flexible and, and sophisticated use, and a set of dedicated servers for um, high memory processing, um, data transfer, and other use. Um, we are the, the CEDA team, we're at the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis and we manage the Jasmine service, but the actual hardware and the core systems are run by the scientific computing department here at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. So it's worth just thinking about some usage examples and Jasmine is, is very much about collaboration and different communities being able to work together and we've got three nice examples here. So. First of all, we've got the um, high resolution climate modeling group, um, which is a collaboration between people in NCAS and the Met Office. And they've used Jasmine to um, analyze and post process um, very high resolution climate simulations, looking at tracking tropical cyclones, as you can see in this plot on the left here. And um, one of the advantages for their use was they got their processing time down from around three months to less than a day to run these kind of um, uh, high-level um, tropical cyclone tracks. The, the middle panel here is the name models. This is a Met Office atmospheric dispersion model. And um, the Met Office has for years shared this with people in the academic community and wider. And we found there was a real advantage in using Jasmine because they could bring over 40 terabytes of input data onto the, our system um, and deploy a single version of the model and the associated data in a way that people could come from a variety of different locations and access the same resources. On the right hand panel, this is the ESA SST um, CCI project. So this is sea surface temperatures for the climate change initiative by ESA and folks at Reading University have generated um, about 50 terabytes of sea surface temperatures for the CEDAR archive and they've been able to process hundreds of terabytes of other earth observation products to generate this. So there are three nice different examples of, of how you might use Jasmine. And let's look at how you might come and approach Jasmine from, from different perspectives, from different user roles. So first of all, thinking as a scientist, um, you'll see that some of the text here is um, highlighted in bold. Those are the things that we're really going to be focusing on today, the, the very basics of getting started with Jasmine. So you'll need to log on. Um, lots of people will use Jasmine um, either to 
store their data or to share data with other people and bring data back to their own site. So there are a number of different protocols and tools that you can use to do that, and we'll talk about some of those today. You might be interested in running your processing code and doing your analyses on Jasmine. And there are two main methods um, that you might use for that. You might log into our interactive servers, or you might want to use our batch cluster and run in parallel. Um, th those particular topics we'll deal with in, in future webinars. And of course, the Cedar archive itself is located on Jasmine, along with large group workspace for specific projects. Um, and you can access the data in those and potentially write your data to group workspaces. You might also be interested in using Jasmine from the perspective of a programmer or software developer. And you might ask, well, why would you want to do that? So typically you'd be writing code um, that needs to access the kind of large environmental data sets that are stored on Jasmine. So having those right next to the code is obviously very useful. Um, we have a, a common software environment, a set of open source tools that are deployed across all the common Jasmine servers, including the Lotus cluster. You've got access to the Lotus cluster, which gives you this parallel processing ability. And it's a place where you can share tools with your end users and potentially with other collaborators. There might be other special cases where you want to develop on bespoke servers or use our cloud. And some groups will be building data processing workflows with tools such as Silk or Rose. So you might also be a principal investigator. So you're taking a higher level view of what you want from Jasmine. Um, so typically you would negotiate and, and request project resources. So you might want these things called groups for workspaces that we'll talk about later, which provide storage. You might want processing capability and access to servers or you might want more bespoke um, resources. And then of course, once a project's running, you need to have people in place to manage those resources because you have multiple users accessing common resources. And it's a place where you can share your data, share your code and set up um, more complex data workflows. Finally, typically you want to generate some data sets to put into the Cedar archive. Um, the last role that might be interested in, in interacting with Jasmine is from the point of view of an interested organisation or funder. So you might be interested in um, funding the future infrastructure or current infrastructure. You might also have requirements that stretch what we currently provide and you want to feed into future developments to improve the service. Um, an example of an existing um, user is, is DEFRA, the government department that's currently exploring if it can use Jasmine for earth observation data processing and sharing of those products. Um, I told you earlier on the size of Jasmine is 20 petabytes. Right now we're in the middle of an upgrade and so we'll be more than doubling the storage available up to 44 petabytes, um, which is equivalent to storing over 10 billion photographs. Um, Clearly, there are many of you out there with lots of requirements, so I'm sure this will be well used. So finally, just a set of links that you can come back to and explore the details um, as, as you wish. So I'll hand you over now to Fatima, who is going to tell you about setting up your Jasmine account. Thank you, Ag. I'm Fatima Chami, and I'm going to be walking, to, uh, walking through the process of creating a new Jasmine account. Jasmine Account Portal was developed here by CEDA to bring a clear separation between Jasmine services and CEDA archive services. It's dedicated to Jasmine users and it's, it's a web interface utility for users to manage access to Jasmine resources. And also it's offered a streamlined portal for external authorizer to grant and reject resources application. Now, to start the process of getting a new account, navigate to the uh, uh, Jasmine account portal homepage. This will take you to this page here and click apply for a new Jasmine account as shown here by the arrow. This will take you to this page. As, any, as you can see from the top of this page, the process is based on four steps. The first step is an application, email verification, approval and then creation of the account. So start with fill, by filling or completing this form and uh, giving your email address, I have to mention that it has to be an institutional email address and select your discipline and your um, 
uh, institution. And if your institution is not on the list, you can add a new one by clicking the plus button. This will take you to this form where you can enter those details. And next, you have to fill the box with the, which says what it, what is you going to be using the adjustment form. So this is some uh, uh, information that will help us to approve your your request. And then submit the submit the application at the bottom of this form. This will take you to the, this will take you to this page, and uh, you will receive an email confirming that we received your application, and then receive the email verification. So please, uh, you have to click on the link to approve the email and then move to the process of completing the last step, which is the creation of the account. So in here, you have to enter your, uh, pick or choose a user and password, and then you have to um, register your SSH key. At the moment, I'll show you next on how to, get to, on how to set up your SSH key. So SSH stands for Secure Shell. It's a protocol that allows login to another computer over the network and it's based on SSH public key authentication, which is a requirement by JASMINE. It's a secure and it's, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's secure over the conventional or traditional way of user and password. The software requirement needed for this, you need to have an SSH client installed on your local machine that you're gonna to use to access JAS, JASMINE and a terminal. This would be, uh, uh, be presented later. So the as to how to set it up, you started, so that's you at the user end. You all have this requirement and you have to, your, to use your institutional network. You're creating those two keys, a private key and a public key. So open the terminal, type the following command, SSH keygen, as it shows here, and it's highlighted on a screenshot from a terminal perspective. This will generate two keys, an IDRSA Jasmine key shown with the double arrow at the end. Now, what you need to do with those keys the public key, which is the file with the extension .pub, this is the part that you need to share in order to access uh, Jasmine. That, uh, I'll explain that next. And the private key should be protected and not shared. The, uh, the, the, the picture at the bottom here just shows the, uh, the public key, which is shared by all Jasmine services, and the private key stays with you. And that will be, uh, uh, when you log in, you will use it. Now, I'll go back to the previous page at the creation of the account. Now we have the key. You have to open your public file key in the text editor, copy paste the content in the box, SSH public key, and then create your account. This will take you to this page to agree to the terms and condition. So you have to just press the button, I agree, and then your, your Jasmine account portal is created. You can proceed now to log in. Open login into your Jasmine account. This will take you to your profile page, which shows all the information that you've entered in your uh, application. And also, it shows you where your services are. You can also access this profile from here at the top. And you can access your services from this button here or from this button here. We see the Jasmine uh, services at, on, the, on the top of the page. Now, this account has, has all the services I'm going to move to a brand new account, which is a dummy user account here. We didn't have any services. So clicking on my services shows me that I don't have any services yet. Now to apply for services, just have to go to login services. Once you click on this, on this uh, category, this will take you to this page. To, to the top of the page shows that the Trust Me login service, and I give you all or two information, uh, two tabs here to click the more information and apply for access. You can apply from this page by clicking apply for access or you can click on the more information to find out what are the servers or the resources that, that this login will um, give you access to and then you can apply from there. After, after open to this, you'll be taken to this box uh, uh, where you have to give the impo uh, supporting information. It is important to, uh, to provide as much as information about your project, who you are working with, or whether you know further or in activities with NERC, and then you apply. This information will be used for the, during the approval process. Once you submit your a request for the Jasmine login role, your request will be in a pending state as shown here, and you receive an application that will receive your request. This goes through to be approved, and after approval, you can, you can check your email or you can check your notification here, which shows that it's been granted. 
and then your request, you know, you have a prompt and you have a sta status as active within expiry dates. Now you have a Jasmine login lock rule, so it allow you access into Jasmine. Now this is a summary of all the services controlled by this uh, Jasmine login rule, as well as uh, you will have access to a home directory and you'll have access to use the Jasmine Analysis platform software. Just a quick one, as you know, please pay attention to the purpose of every server before going and doing any processing. Um, and then next is almost near the end of my presentation here. This is a summary of a flowchart of starting from having a Jasmine account portal that will give you access to the login uh, role, that, then that login role control access to the different services on the left side, the Lotus and the data transfer servers, other services on the right, like the group workspace and app, or group workspace and some data services that need to be applied for access. Now, this is more information for you to know um, um, that you might need to know in the future. If you are still new, I just advise you to read through this. And then uh, this is further information about the article that are very relevant to this section of the, of the, of the webinar and uh, a reference to the Jasmine paper. And um, thank you. I pass it over to Ak. Thank you, Fatima. So, so that was the process of, of getting your account set up um, getting your SSH key um, generated. And now we're actually going to talk about logging into Jasmine servers themselves. So the, um, the common modes that most people will use at the start of connecting to Jasmine, you'll either be logging into work interactively via an SSH session, um, or you'll be interested in transferring files to and from Jasmine typically using rsync or scp over ssh and sam will talk about that in more detail later so we're going to talk about logging in via ssh so we need to think about the appropriate tools that you need to do this and essentially you need a terminal and depending on your host operating system um, there will be different ways that you'll access these um, from linux i think most of you will be fully aware of how to find a terminal, um, but we'll provide a bit more information on using a Mac or Windows. Um, as mentioned before, all of these things support the, the standard protocols and tools that we'll be talking about today. So if you're a Mac user, then you need to search for the, the terminal app um, inside your operating system and then just start that up and that will bring up a a little terminal window that you can then type into. If you're a Windows user, we strongly recommend um, that you use a tool called MOBA Xterm. Um, we've got the link here that, that you can go and, and download it from. And there are two editions, there's a home edition and a professional edition. The home edition is free um, and has a whole heap of features for free. So you can just follow that download link and you'll be able to install that on Windows. So what is Mobrex term? It's a, a, a graphical user interface that, that emulates um, a terminal for you, but you have multiple tabs and a whole heap of other features and tools available that you can read about from this link below. Okay, so when we're ready to go, we really have um, four commands that we need to worry about typing into our terminal. The first one, we need to start an SSH agent session. Now, typically, you only need to do this once, and once you've got your agent session running inside your terminal, you could connect to lots of different servers from that. The second thing here, we're, we're using the SSH add command, and this adds a private key to the SSH agent session that is now running in the terminal. So in this case, we are asking it to add the id underscore rsa underscore jasmine private key that we've generated in the process that Fatima was talking about. Now we have those two things in place, we can log on to the login server at jasmine. So this is jasmine-login1.cda.ac.uk and that is a gateway server that um, most sessions will have to come in through. And um, An important aspect of this is that we are using the minus capital A argument. And, and what that does 
is that it forwards the SSH agent session onto the login server. And that means that when we're now on the login server, we can use the same credentials and log into our target server. So here we're logging into one of the scientific analysis servers. Um, I've chosen to forward the agent session again with minus A, which means that I could then log into another server. I should just mention that my colleagues here with Max informed me that the um, initial command here is not required typically on a Mac. So you don't have to generate your SSH agent session because there's already one running. So there are four key commands that we have to go through, four steps we go through here. So we're just looking at an example here of logging in using MOBA X term on Windows and item one here, we set up the SSH agent session. Item two, we're adding the private key. Now notice here that we've been prompted for a passphrase. So when you create your private key, you should always um, encrypt it with a passphrase. And so we, we have to add that in and it will tell us it's now added the identity of that key. Then we log into the gateway server, the login one server, which is item three here. And there's some output from the server telling us a bit about logging in. And then finally, I want to go to the Jasmine Sci2 server. And at that point, I don't need to type my username or type app because it already knows who I am because I've already logged into the Jasmine login one server. And, and finally, at the bottom, I'm in a command prompt and I can start working interactively on Jasmine. So there's a few things worth thinking about when you log in. Um, many users will say, well, why can't I do anything from the login server? Um, the key thing is that the login server, its only role is really to act um, as, a, as a security gateway. So um, you won't find that your group workspaces are mounted on there, you won't find the Cedar archive on there, and you won't find access to many of the, the software tools on there. So be aware that if you find you're on Jasmine, but you can't find any of the resources you're used to, that you need to SSH to a, a target server that you're actually going to do your work with. In terms of which target server, um, initially when you're just trying Jasmine out and you want to do some generic processing, we'd recommend using one of the Psi servers, and I've used Psi2 here, there's also Psi1 and Psi3, and if you look on our documentation you can find out more. Um, there are other servers that you might have access to that, that are more advanced or depend on the particular project you're working on. It's also worth us mentioning the login message. So when you first log into Jasmine, um, your terminal will display a whole heap of information. Um, a few key aspects of that for you to pay attention to. Please make sure that you've read the acceptable use policy um, so that you know what, what's expected of you as a Jasmine user. Um, you'll see there are also some um, links and a, a contact address. Um, please make sure you use the support at cedar.ac.uk contact rather than any um, specific administrator addresses if you want to get in touch with us. And finally, the message of the day includes information about current resource usage on Jasmine. So it tells you how many people are logged into each of the servers, how much free memory and CPU usage there is. So you might decide from that um, to use a, a machine that's being um, least utilised at that point. Just to say something about the SSH arguments. Um, so we've talked about the importance of the minus capital A argument, which will forward your SSH agent session, and it will mean that you don't have to keep providing um, login credentials. Um, another common SSH argument is minus X, which forwards an X Windows connection. And you'll need to do that on every SSH connection that you need to run if you want to um, forward this connection to run things like a browser interface or, or a GUI window. And it's important to note that at present, the performance of X on Jasmine is not particularly good. And we're aware that some users need to use it, um, but at the moment, it's not very fast. A quick word about data transfer. Um, if you're doing data transfers, which Sam will tell you about in a minute, um, you don't actually need to hop through the login servers. So if, you're, if you want to connect directly to a transfer server, you can do that without the intermediate gateway server. And finally, 
here are some links that you can <coughs> refer to that tell you more about setting up SSH and logging in, um, how to diagnose login problems, and specific support with MOBA XTERM. So now I'm going to hand you over to Sam, who will tell you a bit more about group workspaces. Hello. Um, so I'm going to talk about group workspaces. Um, group work, so first of all, let's start off with a definition of what they actually are. They're essentially large portions of disk allocated to particular projects. So this is a very common sort of use case for Jasmine is uh, a lot of people collaborating, sharing data in a, in a large uh, section of disk. Um, so it's typically used as a kind of common cache for a project, uh, but where people are going to put their process data, where they're going to do their analysis, um, and, uh, and also how they can um, release the data and make it available to others that are users of Jasmine and more broadly. But the key thing to remember is just a chunk of disk. So uh, there's no, no, no particular special magic here in, in some respects. So if you were logged into a uh, Jasmine as Ag's just shown you, um, you would see it under the slash group workspaces area. So uh, the top screenshot here is it shows you uh, a listing from the slash group workspace area. And you can see there are, there are several sections there which basically conform to generations of Jasmine hardware that have been added. So that's probably less significant. Eventually you get down to the actual group workspaces themselves. So I've got an example of the one labeled specs here, which is under slash group workspaces slash Jasmine slash specs. And that's basically just an area for a, a particular project to do its work. So there's no real uh, rules about what goes in there. Okay, uh, one of the key uh, things that we do to make things easy is we always mount uh, these group workspaces under the same location on all the machines. So it's always under slash group workspaces slash Jasmine slash specs. It will be the same on the transfer servers, the generic servers that actually you have to log in and the, the Lotus cluster uh, to actually do like batch processing. It's all going to be the same. And we try to keep it consistent so people can find things. Uh, to actually get access to uh, one of these uh, services, you need to use the accounts portal. So back to where uh, Fatima was showing you how to get an account and then apply for the Jasmine login role so you can log in. Another role you can apply for is access to a group workspace. So go to the accounts portal. There's the Jasmine services tab at the top. One of the things uh, available, one of the um, groups of services is group workspaces. If you click on that, it should give you a list and there's a, there's a button for apply for access. If you click that uh, and fill in the details in much the same way as you did for Jasmine login role, uh, then your request will go off to a, the group workspace manager and, it, and they will approve or reject that on that basis. And you'll get a notification via email. Once they've approved you, what you end up with is access to a particular units group. In this case, it's uh, GWS underscore specs. So that is a group workspace um, uh, uh, associated with a units group so that people can uh, uh, control access. Uh, just a few uh, details about the group workspace manager's role. So the group workspace manager is there basically to sort of uh, to police what's going on, to, to provide um, uh, a communication method with uh, the people at CEDA and to tell you what's going on. It's probably the first contact you would have with them is if you're uh, using Jasmine is you will probably find out which group workspaces to apply uh, for from the group workspace manager because they will be intimately associated with the project. Okay, they're the person who's going to respond to the email and they're the person who's going to tell you what the, what the rules are, um, hopefully. And they also, be, they might do some additional things like help, you, uh, help set up a, uh, different access methods uh, to, um, uh, for the users and also to uh, work out to close the projects down as well. And they'll be the people who talk to the help desk. 
Uh, okay, so here's some here's some generic rules for the rules of the road for group workspaces. Um, group work, so one common problem we have is group workspaces are often uh, confused with the Cedar archive in general. And that's not the case. These group workspaces are, have a limited lifespan, even though it's in years, it's still limited. And we won't be looking at it after, it, it, after that. So the group workspace manager has a responsibility to back that up if that's what they want to do. Um, it's also, while the group workspace looks like a regular file system, there are some things it's not so good at. So particularly, um, it's not the great at, find, at listing files because it's going through a more complicated database type of operation. So uh, find an LS can be slower, try to restrict the number of files in a, in a single directory, avoid uh, overuse of the symbolic links. There's some links to uh, uh, some pages that might help you. Right, so I'm gonna go straight into uh, transferring files. So one of the most common uh, things you're gonna do when uh, logging into Jasmine is try to get, move some data from your local host institute or a computer facility to Jasmine so you can work on it. Um, uh, or and at the end of the project, you might want to move the files out off as well. Uh, well there's lots of uh, articles that are in the help pages to help you with various transfer mechanisms. But the one I'm going to look at here for, uh, for brevity is rsync because it's simple and it's very generic. So let's have a look at a, a simple R sync copy. So if I've got some data on my laptop, this is a screenshot of my laptop, I'm in a particular directory, I've got a file and a directory full of some other data here. Uh, and I'm going to put it onto Jasmine. So the destination here is a group workspace and I'm going to use jasmine-xfer1 as the, as the method, of, uh, as the machine to transfer it to, which will have the group workspace mounted. It's, the, it's an edge machine here. It's not one you'd work on and do work, but it is, it's there to, to just do transfers. Um, so I'm going to use as actuals, uh, SSH uh, uh, to lo log into the machine just to check that it's, uh, I can get onto it with my credentials. It's worth doing this check. So this is SSH spepler at uh, jasmine Expert one And as you can see, I could log in which is the useful thing. So this is a really useful method of checking your credentials work. Um, the destination, uh, as, as it's always mounted in the same place, slash group workspaces, slash jasmine, slash cedarproc, is the group workspace that I'm headed for. I've got a directory underneath there called spepler, as you can see, and it's got some stuff in it. Uh, so that's me checking that the destination is there. Then I'm gonna log out and I'm back on my laptop uh, and in this case, I'm going to uh, I've gone into a directory called uh, uh, which ends in demo, and I'm going to use the rsync command uh, it, it, with a, a couple of arguments. So it's got it's got a minus b option just to, it's verbose, and that's very helpful to see what you're doing, so you can see which files are getting transferred. In this case, I've got a single file uh, and. Then I put in the rest of the syntax is basically the destination, and it's very similar to the SSH syntax. So you put your username at the machine you're going to, in this case, Jasmine Explorer 1, and then there's a colon and then the destination directory. And that will, if I show that in action, it's, it's uh, you'll get the login message because it's using SSH and it tells you what, how much data was sent. And, uh, um, and that should be over on the machine there. It, it works for directories also, so if you use a, a minus R option, it does it recursively. In this case, I'm giving it the EAE-97 directory as, a, as, a, uh, as an example directory, and it's gonna move across and get it into that thing. So that's that it's in operation. It's uh, moved to all the files, you get a message for each file when it's done. As I said at the beginning, there's other ways to transfer data and those are all in the articles. Okay, there's a set of links to the, where those articles are. And I'll hand back over to Thank you. Okay, so here are the list of topics that we've covered today. 
Um, we hope it's been useful and informative. All of the content from this webinar will be made available on the CEDA website over the next couple of weeks at that link there. Um, we'd just like to say massive thanks to our colleagues in the scientific computing department, without whom the Jasmine wouldn't exist as it does today. And now, on to your questions. I have got approximately four questions that I'm going to ask our 